And we're live. Hey guys, welcome back to another cracking installment. This episode is going to be um, a wow conversation, I think. It's going to be touching on some stuff that um, I really think will resonate with you guys. Uh, with me on the line from San Francisco is the author of a book called Memories of MK Ultra: A Journey of Discovery from Darkness to Deliverance. Um, his name is Bill Yarbrough. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to be here. That's our live audience here. Yeah? They're here for you. So, Bill, um, why don't you set this one up for us? This takes us back. Um, I've done some research um, about this whole program that the CIA were essentially um, enabling, let's call it that. Um, started off with the context being the Cold War, from what I understand. Um, but, um, but give us the headline here. Uh, it's the Cold War, etc. Give us some context and set up the show for us. Sure thing. Um, so actually, MK Ultra, they actually uh, adopted that name in 1953. It was a program within the CIA. And you're right, the Cold War uh, created quite a paranoid time about the uh, you know, West falling behind the communists. And uh, they believed that the Chinese and the Russians were doing mind control type of work. So they decided, uh, the CIA decided we needed to do similar. So um, uh, the, the program kicked off. Actually, it probably started several years before that, but the MK Ultra name started then. Uh, and, you know, they had about 150 different projects. Uh, most of them uh, experimented with adults, but some of them experimented with kids. Uh, they, they had several objectives. One big one was to discover how to kind of weaken people when they wanted to do interrogations. So uh, another one was to kind of plant, uh, you kind of, work with people and kind of create a, a blank slate in their mind so that they could program in what they wanted. Uh, and that also included creating subpersonalities that might be carrying out missions that the primary personality was not aware of. Um, and, uh, and then they also, uh, with regard to the, uh, to the, the, they were very interested in uh, LSD and all kinds of psychedelic drugs. So they did a lot of, uh, doping people up without their permission in many cases, just to see what it did, hoping that would give them some insights and mind control. And then a small part of it was actually experimentation with kids. So that's the, the part that I got sucked into. Um, it uh, The really disturbing aspect of it, though, is that um, after the war was over and they started to recruit Nazi talent to help uh, America win the Cold War, so a well-known example of that is Werner von Braun. He was uh, uh, headed up uh, Hitler's rocket engineering program. And they basically brought him to the States to head up America's rocket program. And he actually developed all the rockets, uh, early rockets, including the Saturn V rocket that got us to the moon. Uh, but then they also brought in, uh, and they used a program called Operation Paperclip, where they interviewed uh, the uh, Nazis that were running the death camps. And... Uh, and you know, they had biological weapons expertise because they experimented on the uh, victims in the death camps, or if they had mind control expertise, they wanted to bring them to the United States. So they used the war crime staff to identify those people in this thing called Operation Paperclip. And my father was a member of the wartime, uh, wartime staff. He worked in Nuremberg and also in Dachau. And that's where the mind control, control programs were at. So we think that's one of the big reasons we got sucked into that particular program. Uh, so these people were pretty brutal. Actually, the program I was in, the memories of it was very much like a death camp. They kept us in jail cells. They used electric shock, uh, drugs, uh, and uh, a lot of bizarre stuff like occult, satanic black ceremonies, basically to shock the brain so they could kind of put in what they wanted. So that's mm -hmm. sort of a general setup. That's um, a very great setup. I've got loads of questions here. So, um, so your dad was was part of or involved in to to an extent within this Operation Paperclip story. Um, so, so that's that piece of the coin. Where do you enter the story here? And and is there a connection to your dad being involved in this in this kind of stuff? Sure. So, um, let me answer your second question first. Uh, since my father worked in the war crime staff. Uh, and they were used to identify these people. And then my sister, my brother, and I, uh, basically, we had no idea we were in this program for years. But in our 30s, actually, my brother, yeah, in, in our 30s, the memories actually began to come back with each of us 
individually and then of course collectively as well. So I did confront my father uh, about this uh, uh, after we had recalled a number of memories because we were very puzzled. Uh, and uh, I'll never forget that conversation with him. Uh, his first comment was, well, that sounds like the kind of program your mother would have put you in. <laughs> I, said, I said, he said, well, I was in the Korean War. And I said, well, you know, I wasn't born when you were in the Korean War. This was, we believe, 1958. You were there. Oh, I don't know anything about that. And then in a strange, his voice change and this kind of husky whisper. And he started glancing over his shoulders. And then he would go to me. But, you know, the people who ran that program were really fine people who couldn't control their dark impulses. And then he'd go back to his normal voice and claim no knowledge. And that conversation went that way. And I'd seen that on rare occasions, that other voice. And at that time, I hadn't really realized it was the MK Ultra program that we were in. Uh, I'll tell you how we huh. came to understand that. But the word split just started coming to me that he had a split personality. Part of him knew about it. Part of him didn't. His main personality did not want to have knowledge of this. And, and then when I learned about MK Ultra and then learned that creating split personalities was a key thing they were into, it occurred to me that they could have well, you know, done stuff with him. And so um, I can't, you know, uh, my father passed away a number of years ago, um, but I do have all of his military records showing he was, you know, in the war crime staff at Dachau. That's where a lot of the mind control stuff went on. Mm. So, and based on his reaction, I've concluded that's what's likely happened. I mean, there's other connections. My mother grew up in Nazi Germany. Uh, Verna von Braun's godmother was actually, well, mother was actually my mother's godmother. So they, they, they kind of knew a number of the people from my mother's family that were you know, my grandfather was a general in the German army. So, um, so the way it worked with us, as I said, our memory blocks began to collapse uh, in our 30s in the 1980s. And so when we began to just remember this disturbing stuff, what gave us belief in these memories is the fact that we each independently remembered we were kept in jail cells. We remember that on our own. And then when we compared notes, we realized we had the same memory. And so we began to think, okay, this is really something here. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then the bizarre cult ceremonies. Uh, my sister was older. She, she suspected she was drugged. Uh, and uh, a big book came out recently uh, last fall by a guy named Steve um, uh, Kinzer. And it really got into this Operation Paperclip. Uh, and how they use these people and the individual. It's about the guy who ran MK Ultra, Sidney Gottlieb. And he says in that book that he particularly loved to dope up kids. You know, that was one of his uh, primary, primary uh, focuses. So, um, um, so over time, you know, we began to remember these different aspects of it. Some of them were different with us because we're not we're not necessarily all treated the same way there, but we sort of figured out this, this happened during the summer of 1958, uh, based on the fact that my sister said she was a very good student and, and very outgoing in the spring. And then, you know, very reclusive, you know, very depressed mm -hmm. in the following fall. And I went back, went through all of my parents' books that my mother kept pictures of us, you know, and every picture was dated. So, 1958, April, January through April, lots of pictures, mm. none from uh, May, June and through late July. And then again, lots of pictures. So, you know, I can't prove 100 percent. Richard Helms was uh, Richard Nixon's director of the CIA. He got wind that The New York Times was investigating this. They actually broke the story in December of uh, 1974. So he destroyed almost all of the MK Ultra records. He was actually part of the MK Ultra program. He forgot, he, he forgot to destroy the financial records. So they got those, and there were some records that uh, survived. But, uh, uh, and then the United States government launched major investigations. The U.S. Senate uh, under uh, Frank Church, a U.S. Senator at that time, investigated the CIA, not just MK Ultra, but other CIA abuses. And then President Ford created the Rockefeller Commission, which investigated MK Ultra as well. Uh, but the big one that was significant to us is one President Clinton created, and that was uh, 
the president's advisory uh, committee on radiation experiments. And they actually did interview some of the people that were children in the NK Ultra program because some of the scientists that did the radiation experiments apparently also did that. And then when we read their testimony, it was the jail cells, it was the, you know, the cult ceremonies, it was the drugs, and they used my brother and I as child prostitutes. So that was also what the other people shared. And, and, and they were big into that, uh, um, not just with children, but using women. That's how they lured men. San Francisco had a big, uh, what they call it, um, safe house where they would lure men in with prostitutes and then dope them up with all kinds of stuff. Hmm. You know, you know, them for five days. So I'll pause there. <laughs> yeah, well, that's. Uh, but I mean, the, the, you know, but this, you know, see, it's so funny because I don't know whether you've seen um, a, a program on Netflix called uh, Three Identical Strangers. Have you seen that? Uh, it's a very famous story. All it was all over America about these twins that were that we yes, just discovered. I did, see that. did you yes. see that? It was yes, like it was yes, it was yes. like all over the media. It went viral even before the days of the internet. Um, but yes. uh, it seems to me that at in this period of time between like the you know early 1950s to like 1970, there were a lot of kind of I'm going to use this term loosely now because I can't think of a better one, but uh, social experiments where um, there was, and it was all very, it was like at the birth of, of um, psychiatry, you know, Freud and all this kind of stuff. Um, and it seems to me that in that period of American history, there were a lot of these things. And one of those programs was this uh, program um, that involved twins. And to this day, um, let me go back a step. There were basically, uh, there was one kid arrived at a dormitory walked onto the premises um, at his new school and he had moved there right. and people recognized him as if, you know, they had known him for years. And when right. they connected the dots, it was like, oh shit, you've got a twin. And then the media got a hold of that and then he, they discovered a third twin. And then these three boys um, became famous, Edward, David, and, and Robert. Um, and they literally became famous all around the world. They were on talk shows, this kind of stuff. But no one really knew the malice that underpinned the story because then there were other twins that were discovered. And then suddenly it was like, well, how do you have three kids, one in a, in a high income household, one in a middle income household and one in like a poor household? And what they were trying to un unpack was this idea of nature versus nurture. It was a twin study. Um, and I'm using this as another reference point because I think maybe people would have heard about this thing before. But it seems to me that there was lots of this stuff going on. And to this day, it was classified. Like only recently, as a result of this uh, series, they actually declassified like, you know, something like 20,000 documents. And those were all heavily redacted. So unfortunately, we'll never really know what the key findings were. And the guy that commissioned the study, he died uh, this guy called Peter um, Neubauer. Um, but it's it's frightening what was going on in those days. Um, when you look back at that that time, um, I was reading some of the YouTube comments on um, on this uh, idea of the MK Ultra program. Some say that the program hasn't actually stopped. It's just taken a different form. Um, what do you say to that? Well, actually, you know, they did switch to um, the, the term MK Ultra was dropped. Uh, and then they switched to a term called MK Search uh, that actually did go into the 70s, like you're talking about. And they were really into very bizarre uh, psychic uh, research. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of the book or the movie Men Who Stare at Goats. Uh, okay. George Clooney uh, starred uh, in it, directed it, and produced it. Hmm. No, that was one of those. And the many steroid goats. Have you guys seen that? Yeah, and that was one of the ones that uh, that that uh, that continued after that. Yeah, and you know, I don't know conclusively, uh, based on the research that I've done, uh, that all of you know there could well be programs that haven't been exposed. Certainly, the one you just referred to that was very eerie for us to watch. Uh, I can assure you. Um, uh, and you know, they did work through universities and hospitals. Uh, you know, it wasn't all. All of this wasn't just done by the U.S. government. Uh, the Unibomber, you know, supposedly was in the Harvard University program. Uh, and uh, and um, a number of mental hospitals were involved. So um, uh, the CIA did admit uh, in the 1990s to what's called remote viewing. And that goes back to the psychic experiments, because actually, I believe they did some of that with, with us as well. 
mm. back in the 50s. And they pretty much fessed, fessed up to it. Uh, and uh, uh, but yeah, I I, I'm, I I can't give you a definitive answer uh, of what's going on today. But yes, things that occurred after MK Ultra certainly has have also come to light. So one of the fascinating um, points that uh, the team uncovered uh, when they were briefing me earlier was part of this whole story was that um, America bought the entire world's supply of LSD. <laughs> to support this program, which is pretty insane, right? It's like the entire world, and this is, by the way, only to compete and to develop a, a mind control program to to rival what they thought the Russians had uh, had developed. Um, so, have, I mean, have you? What are yeah. your views on LSD? Because some people, are, you know, some people say that LSD can actually be really helpful to unlock psychological problems within the brain. So there are benefits to it. Of course, in the context of the MK Ultra program, you know, we can always make the assumption that, that the intention wasn't always that clean. Uh, sorry about the pun. But, um, <laughs> but um, the, the LSD story, is that something that you distinctly remember? Well, I know I can't. Uh, again, I was pretty young. I was four. My sister was older. She was eight. She remembers feeling like she was drugged in the program because that's sort of – and. She did experiment with those, you know, I mean, you know, the, the late 60s, some people had that kind of stuff. But uh, she um, but, you know, she can't say with absolute certainty, but certainly all of the documentation that has come out. I mean, that book I mentioned by um, uh, Steve Kinsner, he gets into that, L- the use of LSD and that how actually uh, this uh, uh, Sydney Gottlieb um, uh, actually promoted, you know, the preaching of LSD, you know, and the sixties, you know, mm-hmm. that they sort of were funding some of the people that went out there to, to, that went to Mexico and then that began to preach it. So yeah, the, 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 the historical documentation of the CIA was heavily into LSD is very clearly there. That's, that's, uh, I've seen a lot of references. To yeah. I, I watched the documentary about this whole, um, you know, LSD, uh, drag and what the impacts positively and or negatively were. And when they were experimenting with it roughly at the same time as all of this stuff, um, was that the research was actually quite positive. Um, and to this day, we don't experiment with these kind of mind-altering drugs, quote-unquote, because of the hippie generation. They popularized LSD, um, and the right. establishment didn't like that. Um, and right. so it was like, you know, one love, the Vietnam War was going on, it was about, you know, anti-establishment. And of course, you know, when the public starts taking drugs to kind of, you know, get high on their own supply sort of thing, uh, of course, it's going to get tarnished, and so they banned it because it wasn't banned. There was no pre- there was no precedent to understand well, what should we do with LSD in the public domain. That's right. Um, and so the hippie generation actually ruined it for everybody, <laughs> in a sense, <laughs> because yeah, they had well, the, they had all the fun, and we're sitting here with no actual understanding of what LSD can do to the mind. Yeah, yeah. No, they. Uh, you're right. It was not illegal. Uh, uh, but the CIA, when the CIA experimented a lot with it, and then, as you say, the hippie kind of culture generation emerged, and it began to be used, uh, a wide, a widespread use. Yeah, then suddenly all the laws were passed to even, you know, outlawing marijuana, which is, you know, finally beginning to turn in some states. But yeah, they, they clamped down real hard. And um, 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 there is another unique aspect to our story is that... Um, you know, they didn't just use an American kids. They also used kids from Canada and also uh, South America and Mexico. And uh, and actually, they uh, some of the things that I've read indicated there were a number of, of kids from uh, 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 Mexico that might have been involved. So we have uh, I have memories uh, of a boy that was in the program with us that we think was uh, raised in a shamanic tribe. Mm-hmm. And picked by at birth to become a shaman, and uh, he was 14. He was older than us, but uh, my memories tell me he was he was pretty advanced in that. And um, those, you know, in in a kind of uh, those sort of traditions, shamanic traditions do use certain drugs, you know, uh, in a in a in a way that's quite different from what the you know hippie generation did. And uh, I have some sense, you know, they. They that he, 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 he they may have given some to him, you know, that mm. created some pretty incredible mind expanding uh, 
uh, events that 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 I recall. Yeah, it's um yeah it's it's a fascinating um, story. This to your point, um, where do we go from here? Because I think you know this whole program has rightfully you know, I would say, I was going to actually ask you how many people were actually involved in this program to the best of your knowledge. must have been thousands of kids and adults. Yeah, uh, certainly uh, a a lot of adults. Um, In the program that, one book I read that said there were 150 programs, they said four of them were children. So I think the the use, the the known uh, work with children is not nearly as widespread as with adults, but uh, clearly there were some I couldn't, you know, begin to know what that number might be just because mm. so many records were destroyed. Yeah. Um, uh, but who knows if things continued, you know, what, what, what might have happened. Um, well, I think the interesting angle to the story now is about in this idea, which you write about, which is about, you know, deliverance. So how does one start to, to put together your mind when you've been the subject of intense mind altering drugs you know, um, and these other techniques that were essentially there to develop interrogation techniques for this spy versus spy context between Russia and the U.S. Um, so when you started to become aware of of the, the possibilities here, what was your initial kind of first step towards deliverance? So well, actually, the very first memory uh, that we had was, was, was actually repressed memory we had was before before we even remember them, Carrie Alter was that my mother was psychotic for a period when we were young and that at one point she tried to kill us. She had lined us up and had a knife. Uh, uh, she didn't go through with it. Uh, I think my father came and, 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 and said, what, my God, what are you doing? And then pulled her away. So we, we had that memory. And then the way we developed our memories was to compare notes. Where were you standing? Where was I standing? What was the lighting light? So we realized when we compared notes that we did have the same memory there. And then later on, my mother did ultimately confess to that experience. So that gave us a lot of confidence that that was a repressed memory. Cause you know, a lot of some people claim that repressed memories don't exist, but uh, I, I very much believe they do. And um, you gotta be careful with them because there is a chance for uh, for uh, false memories to, uh, to pop up. But um, uh, what at first, uh, you know, we were hesitant to do things to heal ourselves. Certainly I was, when I remember what my mother did, okay, I knew it. I I began to remember some other abusive things she did, but I didn't really do anything about it uh, because there was some fear of confronting it. And then um, when when, uh, we began, actually what happened, oddly, I went to a movie that sort of was Empire of the Sun that for whatever reason, it created a cathartic effect within me because it was about a boy that was sort of in a prison camp. And I think it it's must have stirred up my unconscious mind to bring this stuff up. And suddenly I felt a lot better. I said, oh, my God, all of these weird fears I have and, and, and getting so much anxiety and just very simple social situations are gone. But it only lasted for about two weeks. So I then I decided to go get therapy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I brought my brother down because he was suffering from a mental illness and we went into therapy with him. And, uh, uh, and so uh, what I would recommend to people that have, you know, severe post-traumatic stress syndrome, which is what I think I had, you really do need to get uh, a therapist, you know, uh, to help you. Uh, and what my first uh, therapist taught me about why I was hesitant to tackle this is he says, uh, at some level, you know, your current personality is going to change. The person you are is not going to be there anymore. And your ego is invested in that personality. So you're attached to it. So there's almost a fear of death Mm. somewhere within you that if you do make these steps, you know, what you know is the unknown in some ways is scarier than the known, even when the known is not good. So that helped me force myself to really begin to engage in a strong uh, therapeutic approach. Now, what I'd like to talk about is, so I did went through, ex- you know, I went with the psychotherapist, two psychotherapists went through extensive uh, therapy, did use some uh, um, uh, hypnotherapy to recall some things we hadn't yet recalled. But there's a lot of techniques out there that I actually could use that I started to use on my own. And one of them is called emotional freedom technique, EMT. Uh, you can go out on the internet and there's a lot of stuff out there that you can see about it, it's sort of tapping on these on these points. Oh, right. So for 
Yeah. So example, so if I would go into meetings at work and that's the place where I felt the most anxiety because, uh, you know, I, as an adult, I was still programmed to react to the environment around me as if there are these Nazi, you know, MK ultra doctors who are threatening to kill me if I don't do what they want. So I'd never really worked through that. So I was actually projecting that onto my superiors. So I was always wanting to please them and always very nervous around them. But then as, and so when I would speak in public or particularly in difficult meetings, they're having some controversy, that would trigger me, you know, trigger me, my, my kind of fear response. Mm-hmm. So as I began to use EFT before those meetings over a period of time, uh, you know, bosses who said, you know, you speak with no confidence, you know, you, you stutter, you hesitate, began to say, you've gotten so much better in your presentations. So I know these kinds of things can help, not just for somebody who's undergone an extreme thing that I did, but a lot of people feel anxiety for lots of things. So that's one of the reasons why I've uh, won another, that's, you know, what I would like to Mm. help people realize uh, that there are a lot of things they can do to help them through these situations. Yeah, uh, uh, Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. So my latest thing that I'm actually writing about, you know, I, I, I'm doing, I just started uh, with a, a psychotherapist, uh, Dr. Holly Holmes Meredith, a column in a local magazine about how to help your emotional health. So we had our first article last month that dealt with kind of binge eating, you know, a lot of people had New Year's resolutions to, uh, you know, lose weight, but, you know, they can't quite break the cycle. So these are tools that could possibly help them. Mm. But fear right now out there is about uh, the coronavirus. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of studies that show uh, that if you live in a constant state of anxiety, it can really weaken your immune system. So by dwelling nonstop on all of these things, you know, you might actually be making yourself more vulnerable. And, uh, and I've read that's, you're seeing articles like that coming out. And uh, so you should pay attention to the news and because you're getting all kinds of good advice and that's rapidly changing, you know, mm. we're pretty much going near lockdown in the Bay area. They're just canceling everything, mm. but <clears throat> to obsess on it, you know, continually might actually make you more vulnerable. So we we'll give a lot of tips, EFT, but just simple things like walking in nature, because if you, you know, Stay six feet away from people. You know, you can still be outdoors. And, uh, uh, you know, meditation can also strengthen uh, your immune system, getting plenty of sleep, you know, watching your diet. So, yeah, that's uh, that's one area that's... Cool. So this whole idea of emotional health is a big one because I don't think we give emotional health as much focus and attention as we do our kind of physical health you know like we've got a a benefit here for all of our staff here they go to crossfits on tuesdays and thursdays probably not so much now with the the coronavirus being around (laughs) um but um but you know the thing actually is you know i i did a lot of research over the weekend about uh, the impact of the corona uh, virus on business in general and the economy and things like that because i recognize that the this is a very out it's a complete outlier event right it's not something that we should be dealing with at all and uh, in many respects we're we're entirely unprepared for the thing um and there's two schools of thought one is that you know it's not as bad as everybody's making it out to be and then there's obviously the doomsday says right so somewhere in between my view is it's never as bad or as good as it seems um but i will say this like when you start to read the media look at the media um, it can totally drive your mindset, whether that will be a positive mindset or a negative mindset. Um, there was actually a piece I was reading on LinkedIn this morning. There was a guy who interviewed, I think, you know, 52 CEOs of US companies ranging from $2 million to $5 million. And he recorded the phone call conversations and all asked them the same questions. And essentially what they did was they then analyzed the words they were using and the frequency of certain words. So if some were being you know, opportunistic or positive or some were being very negative. And what they identified were essentially three profiles of, of CEO, right? So 
one of those CEOs was strategy focused. They were the optimist. They were looking at the opportunities and that's very much where, you know, we're kind of focusing, which is how can we make the most of this? Because in any, you know, situation like the coronavirus, somebody's going to win and you want to be that company. Otherwise, you're going to probably not make it, uh, you know, if you if you then think about things through strategically. And in the middle, you've got a CEO which um, is kind of on the fence. You know, they, they don't know whether they want to make changes or not. And they just try, they, they're, on, they're in a wait and see mindset. And then the third C are those people who consume way too much media <laughs> and they're saying nobody's going to survive, you know, and these are CEOs which are, um, you know, kind of event companies, travel companies, things like this, or just in general, don't think they're going to make it. So when you think about that and the role of media and all of that, and you think about the three types of CEOs, you've got fundamental emotional health markers behind each of them if you know what I'm trying to say. And what, what, what we don't do is pay attention to which bucket do I fall into. And if I am a, the type of CEO that is influenced by media in a negative way, am I implementing the appropriate management techniques? I'm not talking business management. I'm talking about personal management techniques like right. EFT, like emotional freedom technique, like meditation. And actually, one of the key findings was there that the, the CEOs that are optimists, the strategic CEOs, they all meditated as opposed to the other two types of CEOs who didn't. So why I'm saying this is that it's like psychological acupressure, right? You have to be yes. able to kind of unlock that stuff. And where we, yes. and you know, there's no fucking rule book for this stuff that says, hey, when you feel like this, here's what you need to do in order to manage yourself better. Because I can say also that, you know, everybody is scared. When I looked at my 30 staff in the eyes this morning, um, I, everybody was scared. Like I said to them, how is everybody feeling? Uh, about all of this and everyone is very very worried about the impacts of this on on themselves and obviously you know on the country etc and more more broadly the world um and so as the ceo when you're looking at all of this it's a lot of pressure to deal with right um and so mm -hmm. you want to make the right decisions so how do you do that because you know that in this type of environment that you're inheriting which is completely beyond your control where there is no rule book there's no precedent there's nothing at all to really guide you other than your own intuition so what clouds your intuition is essentially emotional um, frequency, right? Or your, your how emotional are you when you deal with the idea of or the question of will my business survive this or my business is definitely not going to survive this, you know? Um, and, right. and I wanted to get into some of these techniques because I think as human beings, you know, we're talking about coronavirus now, but, you know, in your case as well, I mean, you went through some horrific stuff that you've had to manage and then as a consequence transform number one and number two deliver yourself into the person that you are today um so i want to focus on on this idea of of these techniques so what are some of the techniques that you know ceos and business owners listening to the show just general people who are battling to deal with the the reality of this fucking world that we're inheriting right we're seemingly getting more and more crazy um and i want to start with the emotional freedom technique because it is a technique that came up on the show once before uh, with a business mm -hmm. coach, and um, I, I never really got into it. So can you walk us through exactly how does EFT tapping work? Right. So basically, you mentioned Chinese acupressure. It is based on, on Chinese acupressure. And um, a, a guy named Roger Callahan developed it in uh, California a number of years ago, uh, and and, and, and then another guy named Gary Craig really made it very popular by spreading it all over the world via, via the Internet. Uh, and you can just find lots of demonstrations of how to do it on on the Internet. Uh, I use the one Gary Craig uh, pushes. I had the opportunity of meeting him once and you know, been to uh, some, uh, some talks he gave. So uh, but there's other kinds. So, you know, all of them, I think, work uh, just to pick out the one that works for you. But it's basically it's very simple. Um, you know, it, I can just do a quick one-time routine, but, you know, you do what they call psychological setup, where you're just tapping on the, the side of your palm with the other hand and just say, you know, even though I, I have this fear of doing this presentation, I deeply and completely accept myself. And you say that three times. And then you just simply tap on these spots, top of the head, of, on the eyebrow just above the nose and then on the side of the eye and then and you just say fear of doing this presentation and then under the nose fear of doing this presentation 
fear of doing this presentation, fear of doing this presentation, fear of doing this presentation, and right there. And they show those on the internet, those spots. Gary Craig actually does a demonstration of a sore shoulder, uh, but you can use it. And it was really primarily first designed for uh, emotional things. And then you do that routine again and just say, even though I have this remaining fear, you just do it all again. You know, I, you know, I deeply and completely accept myself. Uh, and then you go on to the top. But some forms of EFT, this is really to get rid of the negative, and that's what I've used. But you can also use it to put in the, the positive. I haven't used that as much as because when I get rid of the negative, I already feel positive, so I haven't really seen the need. Um, but, uh, yeah, EFT is probably the simplest technique, you know, with lots of videos out on the Internet on how to follow it. People can do it themselves. I mean, if you're dealing with in, uh, significant issues like I will, I did. You really do need uh, a therapist, you know, to help you yeah, totally. uh, to other things. But if you're just somebody that's got a, a lot of people have a fear of public speaking and now this fear of the coronavirus. So I, I want to be very clear. I do believe it's very important to know what you need to do, you know, uh, to uh, not catch it and not cause other people to catch it. Because in the U.S. they're reporting just this weekend that it looks like a lot more spreading is going on with people who don't have symptoms. So, you know, so, you know, the six feet distancing and all that stuff, the washing of hands, that's all very good. But then your emotional health is very important. So, you know, you, you could tap on something like, uh, you know, uh, even though I have this obsessive fear, uh, obsessive tendency to watch the news, you know, okay. you know, and, and I have this, uh, this is anxiety about in culture, you know, it's not going to make your, your natural fear to keep safe go away. It's going to make go away what what has become crime. Because initially, the way it works is that uh, uh, um, uh, hormones are, you know, if you find something that you're coming across something that's scary, where hormones are released that cause you to suppress your immune system, because that takes energy, mm. so that you have more energy to run away, mm. you know. So on a short term basis, this this tendency is good because it helps you deal with the danger. But if you keep on, keep on obsessing, you know, then it begins to really weaken you. And I've learned that because, you know, I, I've actually for so long, I went into meetings and had a subconscious fear or a unconscious fear of death, you know, because that's what happened. Yeah, well, of course. When I was young. <laughs> yeah, and they actually, did, they actually did kill some kids. And so, um, uh, um, uh, that's why, this would be great to do. And, 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 and then there's a lot of stuff. I mean, there's things called EMDR and uh, NLP and then self hypnosis. There's quite a variety of things that you can, uh, you can learn from a therapist uh, and, and begin. So of course, CEO of a company and actually one company that I, that I worked for in my career, that CEO and it became a very successful company actually reached out and got people that dealt with emotional health issues to do seminars for his whole management teams mm. about didn't use EFT. That wasn't really popular at that time, but meditative type stuff, you know, because he felt you've got to address that side of the equation in order to have a good team. Mm. And, uh, you know, a lot of people thought it was weird, you know, but, but he was very successful. The company was very successful and, and he actually understood the importance of that. But in this environment, you know, that is all the more important. I think you're onto something. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, making sure people take breaks and go outdoors, you know, can have a huge difference. Mm -hmm. I used to do that every day at work, walk for 20 minutes outdoors, because then my stress level would just drop. Um, so if I understand you correctly, it's so the idea is that you're thinking about the, the fact that your business might not make it right or whatever it is. There's a problem that you're trying right. to identify. And then what you do is you, you, you kind of, you know, you, ex, you, you invoke the, the emotion that's attached to that. And then what you're doing is you're tapping through a sequence meridian points, right? And in the process right. of doing that, you're trying to measure the, the level of intensity of that fear or emotion and then through a series of sequences and tapping, and let's just say you do it for a minute or two minutes, five minutes, or whatever, you're looking to establish whether the there's been an improvement in the emotional attachment that you have to that feeling by 
by tapping your meridian points, it's releasing this emotion, right? And so it's a coping technique. It's a hack essentially that allows you to, you know, as would, as you say, these other options as well, like meditation and NLP, et cetera. Um, it, it allows you to manage your emotions better. Is it, am I right to, to say it that way? You're, you're right on. And, and absolutely. And, and measuring is very key. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned that because what we typically do is if you have a fear uh, and uh, you ask them to give it a number from one to 10, you know, so is my fear of, of, of doing this uh, is my fear of confronting this employee, you know, and giving them uh, telling them some things they probably are not going to, like uh, is that a is, is one hardly no fear or a 10 a lot of fear so they'll throw out a number seven so each time you do a round you kind of take a big breath and say so if you were to give a number where is it mm. so i've actually uh and then typically you you hope for and you look for that number to gradually come down now oftentimes and in my case this was certainly the case you know my fears were lot were linked to a number of different experiences you know, so oftentimes, you know, you might go through the fear, but then maybe sadness comes up, you know, mm. another emotion comes up. So then you begin to tap on that emotion. There could be multiple layers to what you tap on if, if it's rooted to things in your childhood. But, you know, if it's not so complex, I'll just give an example. There was one individual that I worked with that was going into a meeting and with this individual hated the people, but they were going to have to be there. And uh, and so they wanted to go through this tapping routine. Uh, and we actually did that in a group. And in a group set, setting, when everybody taps together, it almost amplifies it. Hmm, so we tapped, yeah, we tapped on this hatred. Uh, and fairly quickly, it went down. I mean, what, what was it like an eight? And then it went to a six, and then it went to a four. And then hmm. after that, she said, my God, it's gone. But she didn't believe it was gone for good. But she actually went to that meeting, hmm. and it was gone. So now that's that's not what's going to happen every time because oftentimes it's much more complex than that. But over time, with me and my fears, over a period of months, you know, year, yeah. you know, it, it actually began to have a profound effect. Yeah, it's but so, yeah. yeah, it's interesting, um, mate. I wanted to get into. Have you heard of this idea of the seven stages of grief? Mm -hmm. The Kubler Ross yes. model. So you've got yes. shock. So like the coronavirus. So shock. Oh my God, what the hell's going on? And then there's denial. So these are people who are saying that it's not going to be as bad as it's going to be. Um, then they got the Italians who are completely shut down. Okay. And like now, as you said, LA, New York, you know, they banned restaurants and bars and all this kind of thing. You're saying San Francisco is next, you know, and who knows where it's going to stop. So now that's anger, right? Then you got bargaining, which is kind of seeking for a way out of this whole thing. Um, I think we've kind of this company. We went straight to bargaining. We didn't. <laughs> we didn't try. We didn't try and waste time with shock and denial. Just like this shit's getting real. Because you know, and then and then of course you get depression and then ex testing and acceptance. So, um, so it's, I, I wanted to kind of get into that because if you think about all these techniques, that if you if you follow that idea of the Kubler Ross model of shock, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, testing, and acceptance you start to see where you fall into certain things, right? And I think, as you said, you know, I, I, I'm, you know, self-awareness is such a big deal in this whole space that yeah. we're talking about. If you're talking about emotional health, you have to first be aware of where you sit on the emotional health scale. Um, and because when you become self-aware, you start to make better choices and that ultimately is your ultimate power and where you're, it determines everything really, the, the trajectory of your life, your business, whatever it is. Um, in your world. Right. Um, so with you though, and um, I, I just want to kind of get, I want to bring back in the MK Ultra program for a second. When you've got broken memories and things like that, how does, how did you approach like, you know, resolving certain things and um, you know, whatever they might be, whether they were, you know, repressed memories, the thing with your mom, as you said, you know, she tried to kill you and this kind of things that that kind of stuff, right. Is big deal stuff. Um, and most people I find like they don't have the capacity or the hunger, more importantly, especially as they get older, to want to deal with that stuff. And if you don't deal with it, that's the stuff that defines you forever. And I wanted to kind of right. get your views on like, you know, you know, how have you managed this whole thing? Because if you start to get like these fragments of memories, it's shock. What is that stuff? And then you start to pick it, 
you know, stitch it together. Now you're in denial. You're trying to avoid the fact that this might be happening. Then you get validation from your mom and from other sources. Now you must be pissed off, right? Um, and yeah, then you get into yeah. bargaining, etc. So walk us through, you know, your your personal journey and your process, and and what have you learned about you know the idea of personal transformation and the power of personal transformation? Sure, that's that's a very good question. Uh, I'll hit it on several levels. Just one of them is. One thing you learn if you have repressed memories is the power of the unconscious or the subconscious mind, how that dominates you and you have no idea what's going on there. So, you know, even though I made it to my 30s, early 30s, without knowing about this stuff, it was all inside. And so, like, when I saw a butcher knife, I would always tense up. You know, they would always make me nervous. Words like scissor, I could never pronounce. And then, as I mentioned, you know, whenever authority figures wanted me to do something and I thought I might do something to displease them, I would get extremely, extremely frightened. So as you began to, you know, with us, because I was lucky, I had my brother and my sister and we began to compare notes and that would trigger more memories to come up. And then as these memories came up, then you would say, oh, my God, I understand now why I would react this way, because you're really bringing I know you had a guest on, I think his name was Sterling uh, okay, Hawkins, yeah. you know, who talked about the unconscious mind and he made the comment of just how much information it retains. And I think he was absolutely right. The unconscious mind re remembers every detail mm -hmm. uh, and and your conscious mind only knows a very small amount. So your, your statement of becoming much more aware of all the content that's with inside of you that you may not have been aware of. Uh, and it may be it's not, it may not be an experience that you've repressed like me, but it might be an experience that you've never emotionally dealt with. Mm. So you've, you, you might have a lot of stored up anger or you might have a lot of stored up, you know, fear or depression that you've never really tried to release. Because not only is it still stored maybe in your mind, it's stored in your body, which, of course, then can affect your body negatively. So um, so uh, again. You know, psycho, I mean, uh, psychotherapy was useful, but, you know, hypnotherapy, you know, was very useful. And, and, you know, and, you know, of course, people might be afraid to go to a hypnotherapist's office, but, you know, you and I are talking on Zoom. A lot of those people do these kinds of things. And, and I've actually done it on, on Skype with an individual and it works, you know, led them through an EFT thing. And it was just very rapid progress. You know, this person was in another city many miles away. Uh, this stuff doesn't the time and and space don't really exist when you're dealing with this with this realm and so um 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 and then you know what gives you the energy i mean there's really two things because it is a lot of people are going to resist doing this work i absolutely know it because uh, i've seen that mm -hmm. but two things when the pain of your current circumstances gets bad enough then sometimes people begin to take action. So in this situation, if you're cooped up and you can't visit with people and you're just, you just know it's getting bad, you know, and you might say, okay, maybe I want to watch this thing on EFT and, and maybe, you know, uh, use the, uh, or, or call a therapist or whatever and, uh, and work through it. Um, and then when you feel better, that does fuel your desire to do more. So once you begin to catch and say, oh my God, you know, this really does help me. Now, the other thing to remember is it's a journey and you don't want to over what my current therapist or the one that I've used, uh, not, not now, but in, in, in the past, talked about you've got to integrate. So you make some changes, and you make some real progress hmm. and then maybe you don't, you kind of got to, OK, I'm reacting differently. So you kind of got to find your way being a somewhat different personality, hmm. you know. Because if you just keep on, keep on charging ahead, you can kind of overwhelm yourself, you know. So uh, that's why. Now, now, that's for people that have a lot of stuff over time. Mm. Well, some people, you know, it's not all that complicated. There may be a few events they really need to tackle and they're going to suddenly see, you know, fears will go away or their productivity improves and things like that. I did have the unique experience because of the Indian boy. Uh, our memory of him was repressed. You know, I mentioned the boy from the shaman tribe. You know, uh, he actually gave us uh, a lot of uh, support and comfort, and that caused us not to be as damaged as we otherwise would have been. Yeah. And so when we remembered him, the instant I remembered him, I went through a huge transformation. 
I mean, it was, it was quite, it was like, I knew I was never going to be married. Mm. I grew I mean, I just knew that I was incapable of that. It's interesting. I'm going to suddenly uh, I realized I could do that. I've got it. I like that. I don't want to uh, just touch on it. I've got an Indian boy who works for me. <laughs> <laughs> His name's Maverick. You've been you've been dealing with yeah. him on email. He also um, protects the show as well. He heals it every day because it wouldn't be who it, yeah, what it needs. It would, yeah. <laughs> it's not what it would be without him. You know what I mean. So, kudos <laughs> to all Indian boys around the world. <laughs> well done, man. <laughs> well done, Maverick. You're a legend, my friend. Um, yeah. So <laughs> yeah, this, this was a, this was a native native uh, uh, native Indian uh, from Mexico, uh, but but I've met uh, uh, a lot of folks from India that uh, that are actually more tuned to this stuff than I think uh, most cultures. Um, you know, I've got a fun um, I've got a funny story for you. You know, speaking of the stuff around dealing with the emo emotional stuff that that you've buried, right? Which is kind of a lot right. to a big degree what you've done. Um, there was a, a lady I had on the show. Blonde girl, crazy girl. No, the Christmas show with Carmen Murray. Carmen Murray. Fucking hell, I can't believe I got her name. Uh, Carmen Murray. Um, and uh, so she was on the show and she basically revealed for the first time that she, through her own you know, personal journey of self-discovery, she realized that she, um, had, let's just say, had been taken advantage of uh, when she was younger. Oh. Yeah. Um, and, um, and she now had to deal with that stuff. But so, you know, she's, she's an adult. She like, she didn't think anything had happened and it was just a byproduct and a consequence of a series of events that was unplanned for, just like the coronavirus, I suppose, also unplanned for different contexts completely, obviously. But essentially it put, it put her in a situation where questions were asked. And I believe that, you know, um, questions govern our lives more than we care to admit. Um, and so right. like things like, you know, what are my unique talents? You know, what, um, what actions should I take? Who should I take these actions with? Um, et cetera, et cetera. And we're always looking for this idea of connection. You know, the idea of, you know, the six human needs, one of those things is connection. So that's a Tony Robbins idea. And, um, and in essence, um, she, she was forced to transform herself so that she could become who she was always meant to be. Right, which was, ah. and and we're never finished. And I think I, I want to kind of have one more question to you around this idea of meaning, because um, on that same podcast, I shared the idea that you know uh, meaning is found um, in the tension between who one is and who one should be, and that's where you find, ah. and that's where you find meaning uh, in life. And um, I wanted to ask you about what you've learned about in your own crazy story, which is completely surreal for me, but. Um, but what have you learned about the process of, of meaning and how does one discover meaning in, in life? Um, well, I think that's a great point and it, and it does transform. I mean, I was actually programmed with the political agenda by MK Ultra, uh, actually to become president. So from the time <laughs> I was a little kid. You could totally become a, president, but <laughs> Yeah, I, I was obsessed with that. But and as I began to remember where that all came from, that interest sort of went away. And a lot of the things that um, um, I would have never thought I would develop interest in, you know, uh, uh, emotional health, healing, uh, and also the process of you may be f familiar with the spiritual awakening. Uh, people yes. like Eckhart Tolle. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, that Indian boy, uh, that, that boy from the shamanic tribe, I think, was 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 awake. Uh, uh, actually, all my memories of, of him tell me that. So I've actually gone into that as sort of a pursuit. The healing journey was necessary first because, you know, I never could meditate. You know, no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't do it. But I think once I've done enough healing, now I can. And uh, it's amazingly energizing so the meaning is when you where the meaning comes in is when i have experienced these what these resources can do for you and how it can make your life transform and like you never thought you could be married but you're married uh, you never thought that you could speak before large groups but then you can do that uh, uh you're more comfortable around authority figures you know when you experience that you want other people you know to learn that they're, they're, you know, we're all different and we all need different things, but there's a, a huge range of things people can tap into if they, if they give it a shot. And I know it's hard 
But actually, it's tough times mm. when you have the best chance of actually pursuing those things. Totally. I love that thought. I love that thought. It is totally where transformation happens. It's, it happens. It's in your suffering. That's it. Right. That's, that's where you transform the most. As you said, rightly, it's, you know, yeah. transformation starts when you when the pain is the highest because we that's don't, right. we don't want to make incremental changes. It's like, you know, if you're standing in front of the accountability mirror <laughs> and you're a fat fuck, right? It's very hard to motivate yourself if you say, oh, you know, I need to lose a couple of pounds. But if you're honest with yourself, ruthlessly honest with yourself, and you say to yourself, listen, if I don't lose 10 kilos in the next two months or 20 kilos in the next, whatever it is, like you take the big step, the 10x action piece, right? Or you achieve, you look for the 10x outcome. Um, that's when you don't change. And that's when the coronavirus is going to come get you because you're overweight and you're unhealthy. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, no, I think very well said. Uh, it's it's my experience has been is that when I when I mean the taste of it comes later once you start transforming, then there's a positive motivation because mm. you you say, oh my god, this is wonderful. I think I'm going to try more of that. But it, it it usually unfortunately starts in a difficult place. But you know, a lot of people in the world now are in a difficult place, and so these are techniques that uh, people can begin to pursue. Uh, to help them through this that can actually help them beyond this as well. So Bill, let me, let me wrap this up. I um, always ask my guests this, but, but why do you write about this stuff and, and what gets you out of bed in the morning? Why do you do what you do? Well, initially, uh, I do believe that writing for me when I first started to write my novel, and I made it fiction because um, it's inspired by true events, but you know, I can't absolutely prove a lot of things. You know, They destroyed the records. Uh, so uh, I just felt more comfortable doing that. But it actually had a cathartic effect mm. writing about this stuff. You know, journaling is what they say. That's another one of those techniques that can help work your way through these things. So uh, but when I what what kind of drove me to write this emotional health column uh, 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 with Dr. Holly Holmes Meredith is um, is is, you know, sharing. You know, this with people. To me, that's a big motivator uh, because I, I know that when I've shared this with people in my personal life and they've used it and I've seen what it's done and there's, I don't want to get, you know, but I've seen some cases where things are at rock bottom for individuals, either their marriage will collapse or their job will collapse and then they start doing this stuff and then suddenly a huge transformation occurs. So, um, um, so that, that's a, that's a big, that's a big motivator. Well, Bill, I think that's a fantastic motivator, and um, you know, um, one of the other thing, one of the other points I'll just share with you is that um, something that um, uh, was shared with me on this podcast. A lot of a lot of the stuff I say is just stuff I've learned from other people, so it's hardly mine. Um, but um, but it, they did say one of the points was you know put your vulnerabilities out there, put your failures out there, because when you do, people will see that that those sorts of things in themselves, and that's what will give you yes. a connection to others outside of yourself, connections that really mean something at the end of the day. So, Bill, um, thank you so much for sharing your story. It's been an absolute privilege and honor to have you on the show. Um, and keep sharing. Keep sharing. I think uh, we need more people of you in the world. Yeah, on my website, I'll be putting these columns so people can go look at them, billyarbo.com. Yep. Yep, no worries. We'll post it up in the show notes. Thanks, Bill. All the best, mate. Thank you, man. <laughs>